And we are back with another edition of the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. And yes, you got the normal three faces, but folks, we got a fourth face on huh. the set today. Yeah, we do. And uh, ones that if you have any knowledge of the Atlanta Falcons, which we know you have plenty <laughs> of it, you know this gentleman sitting to my left and to Arch's right. First of all, Derek Rackley, DJ Shockley, Dave Archer, and none other than Michael Vick Woo. joining us here. Yeah. On, we don't normally yeah, yeah, get yeah, round of yeah. applause yeah, on the Falcons yeah. Audible, yeah, but yeah, we're, we're rolling yeah, with yeah, this. Studio yeah. audience yeah. today, man. It's been a while, man. It's good to see you. First of all, Appreciate Mike, you, great to see you, man. How you been doing? been doing great man the family's good life is good it's just I'm ecstatic to be here man. yeah hey, like, hey but, uh, arch the man been on the course arch that's what i know yeah he's been, he been playing Working some breaking 80. he say he's breaking say he 80 low 80s sure. now breaking nice. 80s for sure 80. i'm oh waiting i'm waiting to get him out there <laughs> he ducked me i called him oh, i remember I was when, here like a month ago. I remember I when seven first started doing it right he oh, yeah. comes out there yeah, and he yeah. got these really really nice clubs and stuff and he's swinging it and ball going over there i'll never forget um, you know, a good friend of ours, uh, Alan Ross. Yeah, yeah. Ross, Rossi. Alan Rossi. had his golf tournament. I went out there and I remember everybody just out there just hitting the whack, man. I'm hitting it. And I'm like, first off, he begged me to come. Yeah. Like, he didn't yeah, beg yeah. me, but he was like, you know, just come out and just hang in the car. Yeah. yeah. And I was sitting in the car and I just seen everybody having a good time and I tried to hit it and I couldn't hit it. <laughs> And a long story short, I went and tore my backyard up that day. Oh. I went and found like a used club in Dick's. <laughs> so ten thousand dollars worth crazy of ten thousand dollars worth of damage to my backyard. Right? We all watched this dude play, and there was nobody better, no more exciting to play on the field. But I've never seen a dude more frustrated with a game than the golf game that day. You know, I just couldn't understand how I could. Like throw a pass, like to be a so good at everything yeah. else. Be so and, good, and, and like yeah. so easy, and and then. This little white ball ain't moving. White ball on the ground. It's just going sitting nowhere. there on a tee. <laughs> I remember we had a punter named Toby. I can't remember his last name, but Toby was just driving, and I'm like, that's so beautiful. Like, <laughs> that's what golf is all about. <laughs> and it's just, like the I it, couldn't even I couldn't even hit the ball. For, well, you know, y'all know how golf is. The golf life when you start and when you were hitting it, was just rolling, never got off yeah, the ground. Yeah, man. So it was yeah. motivation. Well, so a couple now you things. Got it. Now you, you know, got the uh, the kind of the 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 theme around the league is like quarterbacks are generally like fantastic golfers. Like you hear about yeah. guys like Tony Romo's getting invitations to different PGA yep. Tour events. Right before you came, Chris Chandler was a fantastic really golfer. Yeah. Um, a lot of quarterbacks and special teams guys, some people would say it's because of their hand-eye coordination. Other we would probably say they got so much oh, time yeah, on their time hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that is. wasn't the case necessarily <laughs> yeah. for Mike. He's telling you that that was not necessarily his yeah. game. But the interesting part is the competitive fire. No right? question. Right. 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 Mike was hot that he, he wasn't able he to He wasn't going to settle for that. I, I wasn't going to tell you no exaggeration. I went and... I'm talking divvied up my backyard. <laughs> it was divots everywhere. And it was like $12,000 worth of damage. Huh? And I was like, you know what? I'll never do that again. I'm going to go to the driving range and tell it. You know, go tell take the divots out of somebody else's yes. yard. Yes. Okay. So we, look, you can see how this is going to go. We could sit here and talk about anything for a matter yeah. of hours. That's what a bunch of former teammates, of course, me and DJ were on the same roster as Mike. Dave, you were around when Mike was yep. playing, covering us as part of the media. So we have all kinds of memories, but let's do our best to try to talk a little okay, bit about football it. because yes, it is an it. exciting time of the year as all the NFL teams are in training camp. We've already had some games, more games are coming up, but we wanted to talk a little bit with Mike, a little bit amongst each other, just about, let's kind of start more broad picture here. And Mike, I'll start with you. Like playing in Atlanta is a little bit different here in 2022 than it was when you yeah. came back in 2001. So tell us like how things were when you started coming out of Virginia Tech, coming down from Blacksburg. Obviously you brought that team to amazing heights and what they were able to do on yeah. a championship level. But then when you step into the NFL, not only just the NFL by itself, but then where you were drafted and all the promise coming into Atlanta, yeah. what was it like for you when you first stepped foot here oh, on soil? Man, that's, that's a great question. Cause I was just talking to somebody a few minutes ago about just the culture and what's been built. Um, when I first walked into the stadium, I think Rack right in 2001, mm -hmm. Aunt, you probably remember mm -hmm. this, and DJ, if you was coming to the games, you would know, there was nobody in the stands. No. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had our first preseason game against Pittsburgh, and I just remember just being on the sideline and saying, you know, was this the right move? Was this the right choice? I know it was out of my hands, but it, 
you know, coming from a place where we had you know, 50,000, really, 60,000 yeah. in the stands, yeah. and then you got the whole upper deck and middle deck empty. Yep. I'm like, yep. something got to change. Yep. And I don't know what has to happen. And I felt like I wasn't ready to play at the time, but I started developing a plan in my mind that if this team is going to go, it's gonna, we're going to go as far as I can take them. And mm -hmm. I knew the second year was going to be very important because the first year I, I really wasn't ready. But, you know, all my energy was geared towards not being a bust. Yeah, and, you, know, you so, know, so that translated into other things. It's funny because I came a year before you, Mike, and the same thing. Like I came from Minnesota, we did not come from big stadiums in college. But when I got here, I was kind of surprised at how empty the stadiums yeah. were. And you guys will remember this, DJ. You might not because you came a few years after. But tickets when you were a player, if you wanted to buy them, were forty eight dollars a pop my what? first year, yeah. right? It? And I don't, I don't want to get too far ahead of it, but after Arthur Blank bought the team and just injected so much life into it, they quickly went from like 48 to like 115, 120 yeah, dollars yeah. a ticket. Yeah. And I was like, payroll Beating deductions a little bit different now. <laughs> but, you know, Dave, you've got to see this kind of transition as well. What have you seen over the years from when Mike and I were playing in the early 2000s to where they've gotten to now? Well, I can tell you all the way back to when I played, this this fan base is starved for for excitement right. i remember we started four and oh in my third year in the league and and all of a sudden you got people meeting you at the airport you got the fans are stand you know people people are painting their faces and that's that hadn't happened for a long time at 91 we got a sniff with that team uh 98 we got a sniff but nothing nothing consistent right and when he came when mike came Things changed from a feeling in the city standpoint, and yeah. it kind of sent chills down my back because it reminded me back to when we got off that 4 0 start. Right. You took them to a 4 0 start. That had, it hadn't happened. Yeah. And, and this city starved for that. Yeah. They, they love their stars. Mike was, there's nobody bigger than this dude was here. But just the feeling the city has for this team. I know you felt it as a fan. Yeah. The fans, yeah. fans loved you. They loved this team. And I, I think they're starved to do that again, man. Yeah. I, I, no, go ahead, sir. When I think about the experience of uh, when I got here in 06, obviously that was my rookie year, and you're talking about the different changes in how the fans were. And I mean, when I first – when you first got here, it was 01, and I was just going to Georgia. And the excitement was already there. But then when I finally got here in 06, it was totally different because they had – you had the it's Michael Vick bad. experience. Yeah. You had all that kind yeah. of stuff going on. And I remember – And that was different for everybody. I had yeah. a Michael Vick experience right. too. I wasn't Michael Vick, but when I walk in, because Mike Vick was on the team, I got me an experience. Yeah, you got to yeah. be a part of it. And it's, yeah. and it's crazy because I remember first training camp. I remember uh, hanging out with Mike before and just you sitting back and you like, people are like crying. People are like, it's like Michael Jackson. Like I was like, man, this dude is – he got, he got, yeah. he got, it's a different energy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. it was cool though because yeah. you got to see it. Me being from Atlanta, you always knew it was passionate fans. You yeah, always yeah. knew they love their team. They ride with who they ride with. And to see it from that point of view of when I was going to college and then when I got here, it's totally different. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, okay, so that's a, that's a great place to lead into. Mike, tell, what culture, we hear the word culture all the time. You guys had a culture here. You were a big reason why. Yeah. What is that? What is culture, and how do you cultivate it? You know, you know I, I think I, I was a I was a part of it, but I think what Arthur did when he lowered ticket sales and he made it affordable for the fans that allowed us to create a culture because we didn't have one. Like it was just we was just kind of coming in, going to work. You know, Coach Reeves did the best he could to coach us up each and every game and you know it, it, we really didn't have life we you know it was a lot of veterans on the team and 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 so you know and going into that 2002 season a lot of changes was made um you know i became a starter and you know we we, we became a fairly young team so we was able to start creating that culture and then you know winning you know cures all so mm -hmm. now that yeah. we you mm -hmm. know we started winning and we you know we went in some games and you know it, it it kind of became our team, yeah. You know, and it was like what we wanted it to be. So it was like myself, you know, Rack, DJ, you know, uh, TJ Duckett, mm -hmm. um, Ward Crump, Dunn, yeah, Crump, Crump yeah. you know, Fan. You know, so we was we was a young team, but we were starting to fill ourselves a little bit, and, and then that combined with the fans and 
then the culture started to come around. Yeah. Now you got Ludacris, you got Outkast, you got everybody yeah. showing up. Mm. And now the game is like, it, it's entertainment. So our culture came from just a, a melting pot of everybody starting with Arthur, making those changes, and then you know, all the influences in the entertainment industry coming and joining along, and us as players saying like, we gonna buckle down and go, my dog, go out Mike and win. Was in, my dog Mike was in videos, him and, <laughs> him and Tip was in the yeah, videos. Yeah, yeah, I was in Tip crazy. video dancing <laughs> stiff, man. <laughs> stiff, my boy. I, t- I still get flack from that for my kids to this day. You know, I want to smooth his T.I. <laughs> he just sitting there like this. I'll yeah, tell you I a memory that hit me, and I got pride out of it. I got pride out of it, okay? One of my favorite movies, guys, is Bad Boys 2. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Classic. And so yeah. Martin Lawrence, so they got that scene where they stand up in slow motion. Yeah. Yeah. And Martin Lawrence is wearing seven. Yeah. It says oh, Vic yeah. on the back. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. remember I that? Seen that? I yeah, seen that cool. a couple months ago. It was, it was cool to see that. Yeah. I oh, man. That. I got pride in that. That wasn't yeah, my jersey. That was awesome. my guy. Yeah. Right? It, was, awesome. it was things like that that helped us create culture and yeah. make playing for the Falcons really cool. That's really cool. Mike, I want to take that a step further because, you know, a lot of times as a former player, I get asked the question. I'm sure you guys do. Like, who is the best athlete you ever played with? Who was the, you know, so on and so forth. They, they'll ask you all these different questions. And for me, it's always the same two people. And I always lead with Mike because he was the most athletic, most, you know, talented player that I ever played with. But I also followed up, I say it's two Virginia Tech guys in D'Angelo Hall. Yes. D'Angelo Hall Damn. had some of the best hips and feet that I've ever seen. Yeah. But I want to go back to you because you're the one that's obviously here is we talked about the Mike Vick experience. And I I tell people a lot of times, I said, what you don't understand is when Mike became popular, he wasn't just one of the most popular NFL players. He was one of the most popular athletes in sport. For sure. You're sitting here, Mike. Talk to the people that are listening about what that was like for you individually as a 21-year-old, 22-year-old, and seeing yourself everywhere, seeing yourself in people wearing your jersey in motion pictures. But you're in your early 20s. It, it was so overwhelming, like to a point where I just felt like I wasn't ready for it. Um, felt like I wasn't deserving of it. Um, mainly because I didn't have a Super Bowl ring. And I felt like with everything that was coming along with, you know, Nike deals and you know, all these endorsements, it, you know, success has to follow. Um, you know, fairly young, really young when it was all happening. but. You know, wasn't a media guy. You know, I dreaded media day. <laughs> I really felt like I didn't appreciate what was in front of me. Like, uh, if I was, I wasn't schooled and ready for it. Like yeah. I said, it was overwhelming. Sure. And, and all I really wanted to do was just play ball. Right. Yeah. All I wanted to do was play ball. And everything else was, I appreciated it. Yeah. And I remember just going through a phase where I just started shaving off all my endorsements because mm-hmm. I felt like it was taken away from football. It was taken away from my time. Um, to commit to the game and even even then you know playing ball you you still want to have your own self time and I just wasn't ready for it if I was 28 years old and if I was as mature as Warwick Dunn was you know like <laughs> yeah. like Warwick was so mature beyond his years I would have been able to handle it a lot different and uh you know certainly appreciated it though because you know the fans make you and, and you know obviously we put in the hard work man but Wow, what a time. That's all I can say, yeah. man. There's I mean, no better time. guy to ask, yeah. okay, than this. Okay, this is a team that's going through transition. We've got a new head coach going into his second season. Nobody better to ask than you coming in. You're a young quarterback taking over a yeah. new regime. Jim Mora takes over, new offense, all that kind of stuff. Michael, what do you what do you do there from a leadership standpoint? Obviously, you got to dial yourself in, yeah. but then how do you get your guys dialed in as well? What's the biggest challenges in doing that? Yeah, the biggest challenge for me, I think first was, you know, I had to really be in tune with the West Coast system, and you know, they introduced that, and Greg Knapp did a great job of working with me and Matt in the beginning, just making sure that we knew all the ins and outs of the offense. I'm glad they drafted Matt because I was able to learn a lot from from Shop. Uh, you know, in, in that in a short period of time because we had to get ready to play. You only got four months. Uh, so I kind of looked at it as, you know, the time is now. And you, you can't you can't look back. You got to go forward. If, if we're going to win, we're going to win now. Going into that year, um, Rich McKay, God bless us all. I love Rich. But Rich had promised, you know, <laughs> if we are in playoff contention after 10 games, you'll get a new contract. So going into – that year with Jim, I had so much on my plate, yeah. mm. but I was able to just put football first, and it was all about winning. Everything was all about winning. I didn't care about Pro Bowls. 
I didn't care about accolades. I didn't. I barely threw for three thousand yards. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think my first year with in that system, I threw for twenty five hundred. Might have ran for like nine hundred. Mm -hmm. So that's only thirty five hundred yards of total offense. And you know, so I, I put. I always felt like I put the team first, and that's why you know, towards you know the you know year six seven when I was here, you know, I started taking it real personal from the media, and I probably should have handled that part better, but. Man, it was all about creating that winning culture, and that's all I cared about, not only for myself, but for the team, my yeah. teammates. Yeah. You, you, you know what an uh, interesting question that I think a lot of guys who were in our position who were athletic quarterbacks, guys yeah. who move around a lot. We got two of them here in Mariota and Ritter, and yeah. everybody talks about their mobility being a big part of it. Yeah. But I remember coming up, and I'm sure you had the same kind of mindset of when people say, okay, where do you go from – trying to prove you're a passer to, okay, well, I can take off when I need to or whenever right. I want to. Right. And that's a big battle for guys yeah. who, when you come out, they say, all right, this guy's just a guy who can run. This guy's just a guy who, when stuff breaks down, he gonna take off, yeah. he gonna run. What do you say to guys like that who are in that kind of mode of, they call you a dual threat guy, right. but you battle with yourself of, okay, I wanna stick in the pocket just a little bit longer yeah. so I can show people that I can throw it, but also, right. I got this guy given ability. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, passing the football, it, it's no quicker way to advance the ball than than passing. Yeah. And I always acknowledge that. I, I'll say this, you know, rest in peace to Greg Knapp. Mm -hmm. um, Greg told me when we first sat down in a hotel in Swan Swanee. Um, did I say that right? Yeah. Yeah. Swine? yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel bad <laughs> asking that because I was damn. I feel like I was. That's wrong. Part of this, part of this, the, the Georgia culture. Yeah, um, yeah. We we sat down and, and he told me, I, I watched all your film, and you are a passer first, and I'm gonna teach you this system. And yes, Jeff Garcia ran it, and Steve Young ran it, and Joe Montana ran it, but you ain't gotta run it like them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And whenever you feel the need to use your instincts. Use your instincts. And another advocate of that was Jim Moore. Jim always told me, hey, listen, if it all breaks down, you do you. So they really ingrained it. And then Dan had already, you know, he already implemented that. Like we, I had, you know, we just had like 18 sweep, like, you yeah. know, like a, a oh, old yeah. school hey, power runner. 18 yeah. sweep, 17 yeah. sweep, go left. And like quarterback draws all over the place. And so, they never tried to change me in that regard. And, you know, people talk about, you know, changing the game and revolutionizing the game. And it was people that, it was guys that came before me, but to straddle that fence, and, and, cause it's a lot of us that we want to be passers. And For sure. We want to show that we can hang in the pocket and we competent enough to do it. But at the end of the day, to all the kids out there listening to the great questions you just posed, proposed, do you. Yeah. Be a dual threat. I, Me I, and Marcus Mariota just had this conversation. You know, <laughs> use your arm and use your legs to the best of your ability because everybody doing it now, so don't feel bad about it. You know what's funny is a quick story is how true this is. I remember we sitting in a mean one night. It was a Saturday night mean. We're watching film or whatever, and that and we're going through film. And they like, all right, they bring this, we gotta slide here. We bring this, you gotta do this. And it was one particular protection of something. Nap says, well, we can't pick this up, Mike, so they bring this. You got to make something happen. <laughs> and, and it was the realest thing. It was like, yeah. it was, it we was ain't going to try to fake it. Introducing the zero. Yeah. yeah. It's when they was introducing the zero blitz. And, and we was like, ahead. and it was, it was, it's funny you say that because like, it was real. They was like, yep. we ain't going to try to do nothing extra. We got a dude that's better than they do, so yep. you make him miss. I, and it was real. I remember sitting here doing radio, and Mike and I had so many conversations pregame. He, he was kind enough to share time with me to do pregame stuff. Um, but I remember sitting doing sports talk here in the city, and they said, well, Mike doesn't look like anybody else. He, he needs to be in, that, be in that box where he can do it. Why? Right, <laughs> right. He just ran for 130 yards against Carolina, and we won the game. What, right. what was it? Yeah, but he ain't going to be able to last. Yeah. I said, well, I think he's going to be the best judge of that. Right. And you right. heard that all the time. And people are always kind of talking about you protecting yourself and all that kind of stuff. Tell me about your thought process. Now, now that's, that's a real thing. Yeah. Especially in the NFL. And now on the flip side of that, longevity is the key. We all know. You got to be on the field. So, I mean – 
when you take off and run, you put yourself in a lot of danger because them dudes on the other side, they banging, they hitting. And the easiest way to further your career, the easiest way to make as much money as you want to make and have an opportunity to win games and win a Super Bowl is to be accountable. And and so, especially as I got older and got to Philadelphia. I was finna say older. Yeah, you ran about older, yeah, it was like, early years. You, yeah, yeah the early years. I was, trying to get that, I was trying to get that extra yard for y'all. I <laughs> yeah. was doing that for I'm yeah, trying yeah. to keep the chains moving for y'all. After I got my contract, yeah, in my fifth season when I played the whole season with a sprained MCL, like people mm. don't know that. I played yep. year five with a sprained ACL, year six. I played all 16 games and you know and and I you know I was work always working towards you know being durable but man you got to protect yourself too because the only way to succeed in this game is to be accountable and be on the field so yes it's great to run the ball it's great to advance it but you also got to protect yourself and you got to be you got to be out there other than that it's gonna be somebody that's <laughs> gonna replace you, and you <laughs> might not never get your position back. You might Correct. not never get your job back. So, be conscious of of what's going on around you on the field as a quarterback. This episode, in part, brought to you by the Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on the Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search, so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger. You can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. Mike, you had, um, we have a, a quarterback here. We talked a little bit about Desmond Ritter and, and Mariota's been in the league a little bit, but not, you know, an everyday starter his every, every season that he's been in the yeah. league. I want to get your opinion for somebody like Desmond Ritter because everybody talks about it specifically for the quarterbacks. When you come into the NFL, at some point the game slows down yeah. as a quarterback. When did you feel like the game finally started to slow down for you? At, at the end of my rookie year. Okay. And, and I spot played for Chris a couple games and it, it didn't go well. I, I remember a game against Chicago that was brutal. Erlacher like, <laughs> like single-handedly whipped us. I know y'all y'all remember that. <laughs> Um, they big Ted Washington Steve in the middle of his ball. Like, <laughs> it was just like a, it was like, it was like a really good defense. Mike Brown at safety. Yeah, uh, I don't even know how I'm remembering all these guys. But <laughs> it was like a nightmare. And then Dallas, That's and then why you them a couple yeah. games, and then a couple games, and all of a sudden, Chris go down uh, second to the last game of the season against Miami, and you know, Coach Reed looked at me and say, "You ready?" I'm like, "Let's go." And I go in and, and have a phenomenal game. And he started me the next week against against St. Louis when it was the greatest show on turf and had a pretty good game. And, and you know, it slowed down at the end. And then going into year two, I was in total control. Yeah. You know, to a point where I even had a couple arguments with Coach Reeves. Coach, I love you to death. Rest, <laughs> rest in peace. But I had to tell Coach, Coach, give it to me. Yeah. Mm. Give me the game plan. Yeah. Open it up. We got 190 plays. Call 160 of them. Come yeah. on, let's go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and he really heard me out, and he knew that I was serious about it, and I was ready for that moment. It was against the Carolina Panthers, like week five or something, and uh, everything changed from that moment, man. I was just ready to like take it on as a passer, as a runner, you know, control the whole game. I was, you know, whatever it took, I, I was ready to be that guy. What would you say to Desmond Ritter right now if you could talk to him about just being a young quarterback trying to make it in this league? I, I would tell him enjoy being a rookie. The same th thing I used to, we used to tell Shock, like you're in a good position to learn. And, you know, it's really no rush. You, you behind the guy who has experience, who knows the game, understands the game, been through the fire, he's gonna go through more fire. You're gonna be able to learn vicariously through him. And everybody else who's, who step behind the center and take a snap. Um, so, you know, this is a precious time. And, you know, he'll find out quick if he get thrown out there early, the severity of, you know, playing the position, as we all know. But as of right now, it's if, soak it in, learn as much as you can, make those mistakes and correct them mm -hmm. and, and, and feel good about where you at each and every day and just try to continue to get better. 
Mike, you well, you're not the only one that had a nightmare in Chicago. I had to play against that 85 bear defense in Chicago. You talking about it easy. My Brian, your Brian Urlacher, my Richard Dent. So, yeah, it was, yeah. For some Mike reason, Singletary. Chicago had to do that to you. So, no, yeah, it's, you it's, it's interesting, Mike, that you brought up being healthy and you said the Bears because I remember back when we were playing – they had that whole like reputation that they were trying to hurt you yep. and that the defense was if they got you down i think greg black got a was funny the defensive story. coordinator about <laughs> yeah. that right like those were the times where yeah. it got real heated yeah. between us and the it, bears it, it, it got so bad my grandmother noticed it <laughs> my grandmother was like no play was like 71 my grandmother called up the dan reeves hey what what, what happened in that game <laughs> And why was they talking? And why was they talking about uh? What they they were saying something like take my knees out yeah. or something. Yeah. And why was they talking about taking his knees out? I'm like, grandma, how you get the audio? <laughs> like, Come on, grandma. How you? And then and then look, grandma, grandma, stop. Don't be calling up here like I'm some baby. I'm not a baby, grandma. I can <laughs> handle this. So so yes, we had a a, a serious <laughs> feud going on with them. And uh, you know, I don't know how grandma caught wind of what was going on. <laughs> she had my back to the, to yeah, the fullest and. I never beat Chicago, man. To this, I never could beat Erlacher in all my years. It, I, it still drives me nuts. But shout player. out to Brian, good player, good friend. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely a, a great defense that they had at that time. They that was part of the reason why they were so competitive. Their yeah. offense wasn't that yeah. great, but their defense yeah. was shut down yeah. uh, at those times. Mike, we talked a little bit about. You mentioned when when Matt Schaub was drafted that you kind of learned from him a little yeah. bit. Not necessarily a veteran. Recently, Todd McClure got uh, elected to go into the ring of honor yep. here for the Atlanta Falcons. So if there was some veterans around when you played, because obviously Desmond Ritter's in a very similar, right. the rookies, Drake London, a similar situation. Who are some of the veterans when you were playing that maybe you pulled aside or you yeah. asked a conversation to or a question to because yeah. you knew they would help get you down the right path? Uh, it was always Warwick. Uh, Warwick was, mm -hmm. he, he was like my worst critic, but a best friend at the same time. And yeah, you know how Warwick, Warwick was, Weezy. he was yeah. big bro. He yeah. was big bro through and through. Um, couldn't get nothing around him. Um, <laughs> Sean Jefferson, yep. Sean was amazing. Yep. Um, I, and I always leaned on Sean. And, and on the defensive side, I always talked to Ed Jasper. Ed, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Ed was a, a great man. And, and, and Keon Carpenter, yeah. you know, those guys yeah. really kind of helped keep me in check. And, um, you know, you know, those guys was a, a great veteran dudes for the locker room, and uh, I could see why Dan brung them in. I love that you mentioned those guys because as I think about all four of those, those were four guys that yeah. will tell it to you real. Mm -hmm. Tell it straight like, to you real. All four of them, like Sean Jay will get in your face oh with his eyes wide yep. open, <laughs> and he would cuss you up and down, and he, no, it ain't good yep. enough. And if you want to yep. play, like, he, it's got to be he better. Gonna, he going he gonna, to – he gonna get you wrapped up. Yeah. Like I seen him do it on plenty of occasions. Yeah. So Sean was definitely that guy. I love that. Love that. What's a, do you have a, uh, you made so many highlights. There were so many things that you did that were unbelievable. Is there, a, is there one that sticks out to you? One Michael Vick play that's kind of this, I know the signature play that people will go to is the Minnesota run. Yeah. Right. And, <laughs> that was unbelievable. I mean, I saw so many of them. I called so many of the games. I'm trying to slide. <laughs> no, he, no, he, he, he was like, so t is there one that sticks out to you? I don't know. That's hard for um, you to do that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was a play against Green Bay in the, in the playoff game, the game that we won, where yeah. uh, the name the defense in, number 94, Baji. Oh, yeah. KGB. KGB. There you go. call him KGB. Yeah. And uh, he had me on the sideline, and – I just remember I just was I just threw him I just threw him off me and and spin back around and I came back through the middle and it was, I was one on one with like a safety and and I was just like you done <laughs> <laughs> you done and I gave him a move and I hit him with one and 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 when I hit him with the move he disappeared and I'd seen the end zone and then he he hit my leg like he like yeah. nipped my leg and I and it was like we beat them 27 to 7 the score would have been 35 to 7 yeah. but i wanted that touchdown bad mm, yeah. it, all because of everything that transpired during the play and i felt like if i'd have made him miss that would have been one of my greatest plays but the fact that i took a defense in and like 
threw him like six <laughs> yards out of bounds. <laughs> Wow. Like that was my retribution to you know, all the things that defenses did to me right. over the years. Yeah. I think that was so, the, that's the only time Green Bay, at least to that point, is the only time Green Bay had ever lost a playoff game yeah. when it was at below home. freezing yeah. at home. We went in there and did yeah. that, then yeah. we racked. Yeah. We went in there and got it, baby. Yeah. 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 I remember that game so vividly, Mike, because people will still ask me about that game. And it's funny because it was, you know, snow was falling oh, and stuff, and they're like, was that game cold? And I was like, Nope. Mm -mm. And I was like, it's crazy what happens yeah. when you win. Yeah. 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 When you win in the playoffs and especially in that environment because of all the things that were stacked up against us in that game, Mike, yeah. I was like, I don't even remember the cold in that game. <laughs> all right, so so give me one. Give me give me a Michael Vick moment. Yeah, I mean, for I'm from Minnesota. Okay. So like well, that was it. That, that was, was it for me. And the Minnesota run. The funny be. part is I still have friends that I went to high school with in Minnesota that will send me a video clip of okay. that play and they'll be like, Hey, do you remember this play? I'm like Dude, do you remember? Can I not? <laughs> okay, first of all, I was sick during that game, but okay. I played through it. Yeah. But like, what a to tough watch, hour, yeah, yeah, wait to tell that rat. Watch him yeah. like <laughs> go through the hour. defense, <laughs> and like two guys My collide against broke. each other, and then Mike just sails into the end zone, and like that. But the funny part is we saw that in practice all the time. Sure. Right? Like we well, the saw best part him about do that. it is when he throws the ball in the stands, it goes in, it goes <laughs> right down the tunnel. That was the classic. I give you my favorite one. What's your favorite one? So this happened my rookie year, and I don't even know if Mike remember this, but I don't even remember what game it was. But I remember something happened in the red zone, and uh, maybe Nathan called a play you wanted or something. You came to the sideline, fire. Yeah. I mean, so high. Yeah. You slammed down. You can't. You said, next time, I'm just going to take off. Came back. Next series <laughs> goes just 70, just because yeah. just he could. Seven. And I was like, this is crazy. This is he crazy. Just, he just said he was going to take <laughs> off. <laughs> like, Literally just sitting there, he's like, I ain't listening to that no more. I'm just going to take off and took off. And I was like, that's the kind of stuff that he could do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. Watch everybody it. looked at like certain stuff in a game where you're like, oh, man, he's super talented. But he was just All that right, kind I'll tell of you, stuff. I'll tell you mine. It, he didn't even, it wasn't even a play. Okay. Post this moment, he went off on Carolina. Uh, he ran for like 140 yards. He had a Superman yeah. dive in there. Oh, yeah, you I did the Michael Jordan against Craig Elo. Jordan goes up, Elo goes like this, <laughs> and comes down, and Jordan's still in the air and shoots it. Your touchdown dive took from the five, and you just stayed in the air all the way to the end zone. I said, how did he do that? Okay, so it was pregame. Okay, the place is juiced because in 03, Mike breaks his leg in preseason yeah. against Baltimore. There is a pall that Ooh, goes that over crazy. this team. You talk about the team. Oh, we're dead. We can't. Oh, God, we're done. I that. That's it. Let's cash. Let's start that. thinking about 04. And so Mike works his way back. You work your way back. And so in December, we're going to play Carolina at home. And he announces, I'm good. I'm going to come back. So the place is jammed. Okay, it's as good a crowd as I can remember other than the NFC Championship game against yeah. Green Bay, okay, right. in 16. Yep. So Michael's ready. You know he's coming back. And all of a sudden, they kind of it kind of gets quiet. And they start playing a little bit of music. And they show in the Jumbotron just smoke. And I don't know if you remember this. Yeah. It's just smoke. And all of a sudden, the smoke starts to clear. And they he's standing the there holding the ball, and he says, yeah. I'm back. And the place went berserk. <laughs> yep. I still make sense. We, we didn't let people know. Was, yeah, we didn't let people know I was coming back. So, yeah. It was, oh, my God. It was God. a moment. It was a moment. Oh, a moment. I, could, I still get chills <laughs> down my back. I'm back. And this place exploded. He was back all right. He went for 140 on well, the ground against well, Carolina. Well, let ran well, let me building. tell you how my teammates at the time. Rack, you wasn't included in this, but they was all Keon. Uh huh. Rest is, rest in peace, yep. Keon. They yep. all was pulling me to the side, like, "Hey, Mike, they say you milking this injury. Man. You, need to go ahead, you need to go ahead and get back." I'm like, so "Bro, I'm just lie. trying to make sure I'm 100 <laughs> yeah. percent. I just want to be 100 percent when I get back out there." But uh, yeah, they gave me a lot of flack, so I felt like I had to. I rushed back for the team. Well, Mike, let me ask you, um, that was a moment, man. As as all QBs do, we we need dudes around us. We yeah. need. Them guys on the outside, the skill guys. You got guys coming in like Mariota Real. We talked about enough about those guys, but you got some receivers. You got some new receivers in this yeah. new regime that's coming yeah. in. All bigger. You play yeah. with a lot of Kyle. a lot of really big good receivers. Yep. You put Kyle in that category as well. Yep. How did you go about transitioning into finding that feel for your receivers throughout a year, especially when you got some new receivers yeah. coming in? Yeah, it, it, it's just reps because you got to figure out. You know, you got to find out who can do what, who yeah. can get away with um, beating man, who's better in zone. Like, can we call an option route for, you know, Cal, or can we call an option route for Tate? What what makes sense for these guys, and how do we put them in the best position? So, you know, I think it's 
you know, it's just as much as it's on the coach, it's on you as a quarterback as yeah. well to kind of identify that. And that's what I think we was always able to do, especially as I moved on and got older and, and my, as, as I got years under my belt, I was able to I see a guy, look at him, and know exactly what he can do, put him in a position where he can, can be successful. And it, it all comes with reps too. Like I, we was predominantly a run team. Mm-hmm. You know, so to speak. You know, we had Ducky, we had Dunn. So, mm-hmm. and you know, we boy, he wanted his carries. He was gonna get yeah. his carries by any means whatever necessary. Whatever that backside in, yeah, yeah. If he crashed too hard, if he crashed too hard, we was pulling that. Pulling out of there, <laughs> or, or put yeah. or put the diesel in and let yeah. him just plow right. forward. Yeah, so, right. you know, you just you, you work with those guys, man. And, and uh, it's unfortunate the guys like Peerless Price. I really didn't get a chance to. Mm-hmm. And I, I felt like he had a lot of potential, but you know, like you say, it's on the coach and the quarterback to know how to use a guy. So, you know, with these big targets that that, that Mariota got now, come Oof. on, man, you got three guys that's over six three. Yeah, mm-hmm. you don't need no speed. Yeah. Just throw it up, we'll Mike. You've been you you played a long time in the league, had a ton of success, and you were able to see different pieces around a team that makes up. A winning franchise right. so I'm gonna have you kind of take off your nostalgic hat for a second and put on your analyst hat yeah we, we look at the Atlanta Falcons but in your career when you saw X Y and Z whether that's offensive line it's defense it's coaching it's wide receiver that can take the top off the defense yeah. right what are the two or three things that you had at, at, at any of your stops that you felt like we're gonna have a special year um. Team specifically or just position wise? Yeah, it could be like you could say great offensive line, okay, or I had you, two receivers you, yep. and they could yep. never lock either of them down, um, or something like that. Yeah, just talking personal experience. Um, when I got to Philadelphia, mm-hmm. like they was more predicated on defense, mm-hmm. and when I seen when the defense and how they practice, and when I practiced against them, I was like, hold on, this is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like I got to step my game up because they they rushing the pass it. Like I remember playing against Philadelphia in yeah what 2005 and mm-hmm. we played them in the uh, NFC postseason. Championship. Yep. And I it just couldn't get away from them. And yeah. then you know now I'm playing for them and it's like all right it's we got it we got a shot. I just got to do my job. And um you know so you along saw with that great in receivers I seen it in practice yeah. and then I seen. Jeremy Macklin and, and Deshaun Jackson when they was in years one and two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just, I'm talking, can flat out run. Yeah. Nobody can cover them one on one. Yeah. yeah. And I wasn't even starting at the time. And it's like, if I step on the field with them, it's going to be a it's party. It's curtains. It's <laughs> game yeah. over. <laughs> and I don't have to use, I don't have to be a runner. I can probably, you know, I could throw it out. And so you know, this is the thing. Now, yeah. now that we on this podcast, and look, it's mad love to yeah. the Atlanta Falcons. That's first love. Yeah. But man, I always wanted to play for Andy Reid. Yeah. Oh. The way right. he used to let Donovan throw that rock, I yeah. used to be over here <laughs> so salty, like <laughs> salivating. Like, Let me kick like that. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, all disciples of what y'all all come from same a, the same tree. Well, still going yeah. on, right? I mean, you talk about he was with Favre. That wasn't bad. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, wasn't yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. Then he, then he yep. Donovan McNabb. Now yeah, he's yep. doing Patrick Mahomes. Yep. So that ain't and, been and, bad, and, right? And he let and he let Patrick. He 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 let those guys run it, man. Yeah. And uh, you know, not not to say that we won't do it right, but uh, coach just he just it, it was just always something different in Look terms different. of offense. Yep. Well, and so you guys all got to hear it here first. I mean, you might think Michael Vick he was a running quarterback. He always wanted to run. Yeah. And Mike's telling you right now, he wanted to go somewhere where yeah, he could air it out. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to. And, and I mean, don't I let him fool you now. He had one of the tightest spirals that I yeah, ever it, seen in yeah, my life. But it was weird, though. It, but, no, it, no, but it no. came around the wrong way. It was a, <laughs> yeah, spinning it the other way. way. <laughs> you know, it came out the wrong hand. I tell you what, in, in looking at quarterbacks, and Shaq and I talk about quarterbacks all the time and stuff, and I know you do too, Mike. One of the prettiest motions you'd ever see. That thing was yeah. easy. Yeah. yeah. It was because easy. You, you're taught, and you tell me if I'm wrong, we taught when you're thrown, they want you to hit, hit that hit that far thigh with your mm-hmm. hand. Yeah. Yeah. To, just to, to, to emphasize I'm following through. through. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got guys, you'll see guys throw and they'll pull the string, right? They'll yep. be right here. Not him. Yeah. I mean, it was all the way through, and it was it was the prettiest motion you ever see in your life. It was different throwing motion, and it's something I worked on for years. And, you know, like I said, a lot of coaches just never tried to change a lot of things that I did, you know, wrong or you know a lot of things that i did right they was just you know i had good coaching for the most part 90 percent um but they also said man just 
do you empathize and do you if it all came down to it so that's the type of liberty quarterbacks need these days mm, yeah. in order to be successful. Yeah. Before uh right before we get out of here, yeah. I, obviously, uh, I want to I want to give my dude a little love. Um I remember the first time walking into the Falcon facility when I got drafted. Mike, I know he don't remember this. My first time ever walking into the fly, walking to Flyer Branch and I walk around the corner that's headed to like where the uh equipment room and you know where the training room although mm -hmm. I come around the corner first guy I see is Mike, and I'm like, dang, uh -oh. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I know I'm finna be in a room with him. I'm finna be yeah, sharing yeah, a team yeah. with him. But the first guy I meet when I walk in the building, and I'm like, he don't know my name. He don't know who. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He don't yeah. walk around the corner. And I say, this is like people ask me all the time, what kind of dude is he? What is he like? And I was like, he the most genuine dude you will know. Most laid back guy, real cool. You know. And I walk around the corner, and soon as he see me, I see his hand open up. And I'm like, oh, he finna dab me up. And he said, DJ, what's up? Glad to have you on the squad. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm blown. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like this man, the face of the NFL. Yeah. And, you know, he offering a olive branch to me. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And I just want people to know, like, that's the kind of dude he is all the time. And people only see, you know what I'm saying, him on the field. They see him, you know, now yeah. doing his thing on Fox. But Genuine dude, man. And I think that's why all his teammates always loved him. Everybody always ride for him. Yeah. I mean, when he came at I me, mean, you should at practice today, everybody that seen him, former players, former, you know, guys who played, whatever it was. It means a lot too, it's man. It's all love. It means so much to me too. It means so Staff, much. Staff, everybody. I can't, I can't say to be able to, to, to come back to a place and like, it, it's so good to see y'all too. Like, I can't even lie. Like today has been an amazing day. Just seeing everybody, being able to talk to everybody. like. Guys out there, I don't even know coaching staff. This I, I'm so unfamiliar with. Yeah, Y'all yeah. know him better than yeah. me. And, <laughs> and I come back and it's like welcome me back with open arms. And it's like we pick up what we left off. And you know the relationship's going to continue to get stronger and tighter and better. And that's that's what it's all about, man. Mike, last question before we let you go. I know all four of us have probably gotten this question asked to us in some variety. And I'm curious what your answer is. But a lot of people ask me, what do you miss the most? That you're not playing in the I NFL miss being anymore. Around the guys, man. I miss coming. Hmm. I miss coming in every day and laughing. Yeah. And just you know, the football was that. Sometimes when we went out to practice, we felt like we we would have rather much stayed in the locker room and just <laughs> talked. Yeah. Y'all yeah. yeah, know it. And yeah. just hung out. And when it was yeah. time to go out there, you know, we'd walk out there and we'd handle a lot of business. And we come back in and, and you know, it's a party again. And, and man, we just had from traveling to team events man we just we just had we had a great time and yeah. then especially as i got older i started wanting to spend more time like spending time with y'all became more important so we started golfing together and mm -hmm. i learned to golf and mm -hmm. was going to golf tournaments and then boom you know it came to an abrupt ending but you know i i thank everybody for making that time like i grew up with with you guys and and, and that that meant a lot man so we share a lot of great memories and that's why we can sit here Right now, like I say, pick up where we left off. It's real too, because yeah. I remember about a couple, couple months ago, Roddy got married and all us back in there, mm -hmm. it was yep. like old times, you know, yeah, it felt yep. like the locker room again. That's yep. the thing that P, uh, that's hard to explain to fans and not saying they don't understand or don't have it somewhere in their lives, but the whole locker room experience different, um, is different, different you yeah. know, and it, yep. it's, it's, there is no, there is no, uh, no what you look like, yep. what you what you sound nope. like, well, none of that stuff. Yeah. We're all yeah. the, we're all the same, right? Yep. I mean, what you were joking about? I mean, we used to get on Billy White Shoes Johnson about how bushy his mustache. I mean, you, <laughs> yeah. these stupid it's, stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. But, you, but it was so funny because oh, you. Awesome. But and I know I know that's what you're talking about. You can't replace that. I mean, we could talk about games. We all had highlights and games yeah. and did things. But ultimately, it comes back to those dudes you went out on the field with, yep. and I know you had some you had some great moments like that. Man, it's great to hear that because I, I think that's probably the misconception out there about the NFL that it's all about money, it's all about business. Yeah. I bet you you'd be asked 90, 95, 99 percent of the guys like, "What do you miss the most?" Oh, they're gonna say they're sitting like, on that stool in your no locker, no yep. cutting up with your teammates, yep. no yeah. Doubt. Joking, no. jonesing, talking <laughs> yeah. about what you did the night before, yeah. whatever it may That's be. It. Eating food on the plane, and yeah. eating Popeyes. And yeah. <laughs> bro, like, I mean, he just brought it up earlier today. He was, he still remember 
first time me not bringing biscuits to the meet. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Ain't go back. Like, yeah. you know, my bad, right. 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 my bad, y'all. I got that <laughs> my bad shop. <laughs> my bad shop. Yeah. You just... <laughs> Yeah. Well, Good look, time. Mike, uh, yeah. we truly appreciate you joining us, man. It's great to see you again. One of the best all time to ever wear this jersey. Um, it's great that they brought you back in the building. I think it's an awesome move by the organization to get a bunch of the former players to be around the new generation um, and talk to them, mentor them, if you will, and and do the do what we can to kind of continue to advance this organization. Absolutely. So it's great to see you. I'm Let's glad you came back and. We're here on the Falcons Audible. Truly fortunate that you were able to sit in with us. So, yeah, as I once saw on a big jumbotron, he's, he's back. back. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to wrap it up, everybody. Yes, we thanks so much for joining us again. This is Mike Vick in town, joining us here on the Falcons Audible, presented by AT and T. Us three will be back next week. Probably not as much star, star power, but we're going to bring you everything we got. For thanks sure. a lot for joining us, everyone.